We would like to advise that the following program may contain real news, occasional philosophy, and ideas that may offend some listeners. This is The Future This Week. On Sydney Business Insights, I'm Sandra Peter. And I'm Kai Rima. Every week we get together and look at the news of the week. We discuss technology, the future of business, the weird and the wonderful, and things that change the world. Okay, let's start. Let's start. Today on the 100th episode, Wonderful Country Trap, Weird Bacteria Innovation and Elon's Leaf Blower. I'm Sandra Peter, I'm the Director of Sydney Business Insights. I'm Kai Rima, Professor at the Business School and Leader of the Digital Structure Research Group. So Sandra, what happened in the future this week? Well, 100 episodes happened. All this week? No, and not exactly 100 episodes, but pretty much 100 episodes since we first started doing the future this week. Well, if we discount all the trailers, then this is officially the 100th episode of The Future This Week. Woohoo! That was Megan, all excited. We're still here. We survived. We're still going. And we had to decide on what we do for the 100th episode. So after spending about an hour counting the episodes and do we count trailers, do we not count trailers? And after deciding on whether we were going to do the best of or our favorite stories or our least favorite stories or just normal stories from this week. We remembered that We often say the weird and the wonderful in our intro, so we thought... Why not do that, the weird and the wonderful? So this week, rather than preparing stories together, Sandra and I each picked a weird and wonderful story that very much have to do with what we normally do on The Future This Week, but which are also slightly different. And I think your story should come first. So, Sandra, tell me, what's your story? So let me ask you, have you heard of Old Town Road? Uh, no. Actually, that's what I said the first time Andrea asked me that question. Andrea Miles? Yep, we were having coffee. Andrea Miles is one of the members of our board of advice at the business school here at the University of Sydney. And she is absolutely fantastic. She has lived for a very long time in China. She's become an expert in all things Chinese. And now she runs an award-winning multi-million dollar startup that connects people and entrepreneurs and innovators from Australia and China. And she's one of Australia's 100 most influential women for all the work that she's done in China. And she started telling me this story about Old Town Road. And that got you interested? That got me very interested. So Old Town Road, what's that about? Is that Silk Road? It sounds country to me. So it all starts in Atlanta, Georgia, with this guy called Lil Nas X. And Lil Nas X, in his bedroom, he's black. I think his girlfriend left him. I don't even know if that's true. The thing is, he looks back at his life and goes, you know, I'm sad, I'm lonely, I'm in my apartment, my life's like a country song. So I'm going to write myself a country song. So that's what he sets about doing. He buys a beat. And that's October of last year. He spent $30 on this. And starts writing some lyrics. And the lyrics are exactly what you'd expect from a country boy in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, I'm gonna take my horse to the old town road. I'm gonna ride till I can't no more. But Lil Nas X, he also a rapper. So there's a beat change in it. So he puts this up much like we do every week on SoundCloud. And at the same time, he starts tweeting about it, but also makes it available on TikTok. So TikTok, for those of you who haven't listened to our recent episode about China tech with Barney Tan, we put it in the show notes. TikTok is a Chinese platform for recording and exchanging short videos, 15 seconds long, and it has come to popularity because it's got these weird challenges that people set each other. It's very much based around hashtags and an algorithm that creates a feed of interesting things that are similar to what people are watching. And it's become a bit of a craze, especially among young people. So Lil Nas X times this with a challenge on TikTok. And this challenge is called the Yeehaw Challenge. Yeehaw! (laughs) (laughs) And again, we'll put a link in the show notes with the Yeehaw Challenge on TikTok. So you can watch these people who for 15 seconds have a challenge of picking a country song that has a really good beat change 
and changing their clothes when the beat changes. So imagine people in normal clothes, just hanging around, dancing around, and then the beat drops. I got the horses in the back, horse stock is attached. Head is mad at black, got the boots is black to match. And then suddenly they're in country clothing, dancing to country music. And there's thousands of these videos now, apparently. And I've only spent a couple of hours looking at them last night. We'll include them in the show notes if you want to go down the rabbit hole. So what happens next? So since this is available on TikTok for free, people start using it. It's absolutely perfect for the Yeehaw Challenge. It's 15 seconds. Conveniently. Conveniently, with the beat change in it, and people start downloading and downloading. And it's on Twitter. It's well-timed with the Yeehaw agenda in general, which is black artists getting into country music. And it goes viral, insanely viral. So much so that because the billboard charts now take into account streams on YouTube and platforms like SoundCloud and Spotify, it ends up charting in the billboard country charts. So Lil Nas X, black guy from Atlanta, now charts in the billboard. By mid-March, it's one of the hot country songs on the Billboard chart. In one week, it already makes it to number 19. And guess what? It makes it to the number one on the country charts. Even before Lil Nas X has signed with any record label, has made any record deals, it's up there at number one. And then it disappears. Dun, 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 dun. And so why? Well, quite unceremoniously, Billboard pulls it from the Billboard Hot Country Song chart and it tells Rolling Stone magazine that while Old Town Road incorporates some references to country and cowboy imagery, it does not embrace enough of today's country music elements to chart in its current version. Now, of course, this move enrages the internet. It's picked up on Twitter, it's picked up on social media and ignites a conversation about genre and about race on the Billboard country charts. Remember Lil Nas X. He black. He black. But that can't be all. No, it isn't. And let me tell you what happens here. Billy Ray Cyrus jumps into the mix. Of course, Billy Ray Cyrus, father of Miley Cyrus, and also country music royalty jumps in on it and actually tweets. And again, we'll include all of this in the show notes. It was so obvious to me after hearing the song just one time. I was thinking, what's not country about that? What's the rudimentary element of a country and Western song? Then I thought it's honest, humble. It has an infectious hook and a banjo. What the hell more do you need? Well, turns out... Turns out you actually need Billy Ray Cyrus. By the 5th of April, and this is only a few days before Lil Nas X's 20th birthday, he signs with Columbia Records and remixes the song. Yeah, I'm gonna take my horse to the old town road. I'm gonna ride till I can't no more. I got the horses in the back. Horse stock is attached. So as you can hear, this is pretty much exactly the same song, but now also featuring Billy Ray Cyrus. Who is white. So by the end of April, Lil Nas X tops the Billboard Hot 100 for a fourth week in a row with Old Town Road, now featuring Billy Ray Cyrus. Who makes it country. And this is indeed how the story was mostly covered. So I want to have a really quick look at how this has been covered in the news. And whilst we'll include one main story, as we usually do, from The Guardian telling you the whole story of Lil Nas X, whose real name, by the way, is Montero Lamar Hill. Not that that matters, but, you know, we thought you should know. This has first been covered by many, many outlets as a story about racism, basically, in country and the difficulty that black musicians have in breaking into the country charts only like five percent of songs in the top 100 billboard country charts are from black artists whereas overall black artists actually make up more than half of the charts in billboard so country is very much a white domain and that's the main angle right so that indeed has dominated a lot of the stories including on NPR and on The Guardian with country's race problem and in the New York Times. 
But there was another way in which this has been covered, which was a story about industry dissolution, about disruption of country music, and even more than that, of what genre is. Traditionally, we think of music in genres, country music, pop music, hip hop. But this song is country trap, something no one had heard of before. So mixing and remixing of genres, but also, and Wired picked up this story, also a conversation about how genre, maybe like gender, is an increasingly outdated construct that what we really have these days is not the genres, but moods. If you go on Spotify or if you go on SoundCloud, quite often you don't pick a genre of music, but a mood that you want to listen to chilled, relaxed, upbeat, or a time that you want to listen to, barbecue music or road tripping music, rather than genres. But there is a third angle that we need to highlight before we can move to the weird and wonderful of this story, which was that this song, while it might sound like a fluke, like a thing that just rode the waves, was actually a well thought out move by Lil Nas X, who pretty well understands how social media works and lives in that world. He's been active on Twitter for years and years and was very familiar with how to construct or to game something going viral on Twitter. So he's been engaging in activities called tweet decking, where people with lots of followers get together and create game virality by retweeting certain tweets and making them rise to the top of the most shared content on Twitter. Many of these accounts, by the way, have been suspended by Twitter for violating spam policies and so on. And Lil Nas X no longer engages in that. But when talking to NPR, he talked about how he knew that the lines that he wanted to write for this song, he wanted them to be quite memeable. So memeability, you know, I'm not sure that this is a word, but let's roll with it because it's exactly what he seems to have done, right? So he engineered this song to be used on various social media platforms. Yeah. So he talks about how I got horses in the back. It was going to be a meme. And then the cowboy hat from Gucci, Wrangler on my booty riding a horse, you can whip your Porsche, and so on. And he says, these are all very quotable. I was doing that the entire month of making the song. Put this right here. Oh, it's going to be the best plan ever. And he says, and you know, it worked. And I'm sure it is no coincidence that the little clip with the beat change is exactly 15 seconds, which is the TikTok length for sharing videos. Yeah. So what put this at the confluence of a number of trends that are really technology trends, the way memes spread on Twitter, the way challenges work on TikTok. But interestingly, and this is where I wanted to land with this weird and wonderful story, which is one of my favorite ones for this year, I must say. So thank you, Andrea. Is that no one really highlighted the angle of what TikTok did for this. So the reason it rose to the top of the Billboard charts was the fact that it had been downloaded millions and millions of times, and this was enabled to a large extent by a large Chinese social media platform. As we discussed in our previous podcast about TikTok, not many people know about it, or if they do, not many people know it's a Chinese tech giant. So this is really a weird and wonderful story where different worlds collide. The world of black music and rap, the white-dominated country charts, and an emerging Chinese internet platform, which for all intents and purposes will not be very well known among the traditional US country listeners, who had such an influence in pretty much washing this song up the billboard charts. So thinking about disruption in the country music industry, it becomes fascinating to consider the number of digital trends that had to come together for this sort of story to emerge. TikTok, memeing on Twitter, downloading from YouTube, the fact that streaming now plays a role 
in the billboard charts and also platforms such as SoundCloud, which allow everyone to promote their own music and to feature as self-promoting artists. And this is, again, not to take away from the quality or the catchiness of Old Town Road. It's definitely, even at less than two minutes, this is how long the song is, it's definitely one that you can listen to over and over again and it's got a good beat and a good sound. Yeah, it was made famous by teenagers in clips where they all just miraculously transform into cowboys after drinking some mystical yeehaw juice. So, this is a pretty unusual disruption story, but it also highlights a deep truth in disruption as a phenomenon, and we've covered this previously on the podcast, which is disruptions often emerge, they are weird, they come from the fringes, they are often the result of many converging trends. Think about the music industry and the digital disruption there. It had to have the internet emerging and MP3 as a standard and CD burners that allowed people to rip music and then the iPod and the iPhone and screens. And so all of these things coming together in disrupting this industry. And we have another story here where a lot of these unpredictable things have to coalesce to actually bring about this phenomenon. And that is not to take away from the agency of single actors. Lil Nas X certainly did his bit in doing this, but he was by no means really in charge of this trend because he had to rely on hundreds of thousands of people on TikTok actually picking up the song and doing these challenges. So to me, this is really fascinating. And of course, it also has horses, which were in the first podcast we ever did. We talked about the great horse manure crisis of 1894. And you know what? We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. And you know what else? My story got horses too. Tell us about your story. Okay. So... My story is a story about horses and dirt and shit and soil and bacteria, obsession, innovation, worldviews, money, the history of an idea and the future of an industry. And ultimately, it is also about business with China again. So before I start telling you this weird story that I came across just a couple of days ago, let me begin by saying this was published in Bloomberg. Business Week. I'm just saying this because the story is rather obscure and weird. So let me put it out there that this is not from some really obscure magazine. So this story is also set in the US. It features David Whitlock, who is not 19, but 64. And he couldn't be more different to a little Nas X because David Whitlock is an engineer, an inventor, you could say. And he's described in the article as going bald, wearing standard rimmed glasses, wearing used jeans, flannel shirts, hiking boots, and drinking coffee from a mug that hasn't been washed in about 20 years. And David is also severely autistic and quite aware of it and flippant about it. And that sort of plays some part in this story. So the story begins in the year 2000 when... David had a school teacher friend and she asked him one day why her horse would roll in the dirt even though it was still in the cool springtime and insects weren't actually biting the horse. So, you know, her assumption being they roll around to get rid of the insects. And because he kind of was fond of his friend, he tried to find an answer and he really got obsessed about figuring out, you know, what those horses were doing. So he tried to find an answer and started to dig deeper and do his research. And it's worth knowing here that he's got two degrees, uh, bachelor and master in chemical engineering from MIT. So this is his background. He used to have a career in the cement industry and together with his business partner, Walter Hilly Thompson, he actually patented an environmentally friendly way of producing cement and they sold their company. So he's got this background in chemistry and so he starts isolating bacteria from the soil that those horses would roll around in and what he found fascinated him. He found a type of bacteria that actually derives energy from ammonia rather than organic matter, meaning that they can feed on sweat. 
And so he came up with this idea that, hey, maybe those bacteria could be useful in humans too. And this is where this story all takes a quite a weird turn. Tell me he doesn't roll around in shit. He does something like that. So what he did is he isolated this type of ammonia oxidizing bacteria or AOB that will become important in the story and read up on it. And it turns out that those bacteria are quite useful. They convert ammonia into nitrate, which have anti-infective properties, so actually help the skin, and nitric oxide, which Science Magazine actually declared molecule of the year in 1992. And quoting here, it helps maintain blood pressure by dilating blood vessels, helps kill foreign invaders in the immune response, is a major biochemical mediator of penile erections. <laughs> I do not kid you, this is from Science Magazine, and is probably a major biochemical component of long-term memory. That's the magazine's editor at the time. And in 1998, three Americans actually won the Nobel Prize for this discovery. So what does David do with this? So David starts obsessing about this, and he extracts a particular AOB, ammonia oxidizing bacteria called nitrosomonas eutropha, which he describes as relatively athletic, meaning it has good qualities. He builds a makeshift tank from an old aquarium and starts self-experimenting. So he basically uses this bacteria and smears it on his skin. He stops showering. Turns out, this stuff is pretty miraculous because he develops no body odor, no body smell and it's gross right it is absolutely yes. gross but this is in blomberg business week right i remind that you doesn't make it beginning. any less gross well we're going places with this <laughs> now he obsesses so much that he starts spending all his money on patent applications to the point where in 2009 he sells his apartment and he moves into his white dodge grand caravan where he you know doesn't have to shower because no, he's got no, the bacteria. Exactly. So he lives out of his car, parks in the parking lot of his own employer, the cement company where he still has an office and really goes down the rabbit hole. Now, turns out David has good friends. So first of all, Walter Hilly Thompson spends $600,000 of his own money and then starts raising money for his friend. And a first investor comes on board, Jamie Haywood, who is the co-founder of Patients Like Me, an online info sharing network, who David gifted a tinfoil wrapped bottle with his Alexia three years ago. And he basically used it on himself as well and grew really fond of the product. So long story short, this weird story about this guy experimenting with horse poop and bacteria coincides with the development that happens in the wider world, which is an increased interest in what is called the human microbiome. So in parallel, a whole research stream evolves, which takes an interest in how our body is actually inhabited by a lot of so-called good bacteria. And so there's increasing interest in the microbiome, not only from the research side, but also in Silicon Valley. So the funding for companies uh, engaged in microbiome research and product development has grown from about $170 million in 2015 to over a billion dollars quite recently. So David's weird self-experimentation coincides with this emerging trend. Jamie Haywood, who raised the initial $1.4 million dollars of funding for David's ideas has him founding a company called AO Biome, so AOB, AO Biome. And with this company, they start rigorous testing. And it turns out that one of their first products is a spray that basically can be used to cultivate these bacteria on human skin instead of using deodorant or soap. And it so happens that one of the subjects in the initial trial is a writer for the New York Times who writes an article for New York Times magazine, which leads to a lot of inquiries from prospective customers and the company launching a cosmetic brand called Mother Dirt. Now, it all evolves from there. The company starts outsourcing its bacteria farming to India records its first profit and is now a $100 million startup. 
all of this happens at the same time as the industry more widely starts taking an interest. And this is important because we're talking about an industry now that, for all intents and purposes, has spent the last 20 years propagating the ideas that bacteria are bad. We're talking about companies who are in the business of selling antibacterial soap and dispensers and hand wash. And killing 99.9% .9 of the germs. Absolutely. But at the same time, there is now this undercurrent of development in Silicon Valley, from inventors, from David's company, that basically propagate the opposite view, that rather than killing bacteria on human skin and also in the human body more broadly, could actually be the wrong approach, that rather than killing bacteria, we need to distinguish good and bad and then start cultivating bacteria and working in restoring the human microbiome because uh, research has shown, for example, that people in Western societies only have about half the diversity of bacteria in the body that you know, native tribes, for example, would have. And so now we have this counter movement, which actually are pro-bacterial in a world where every one of us has been educated that bacteria are the bad guys, right? We talk antibiotics, we talk hand wash, and so AO Biome Therapeutics, the company that David founded, is now engaged in six clinical trials to treat a wide range of conditions such as acne, eczema, rosacea, hay fever, hypertension, and migraines. And it has raised its profile to the extent that it's recently been injected, pun intended, with a lot of funding from Beijing Genomics Institute and its founder, by the name of Jun Wang, is now AO Biome's chairman. And Wang says, we are thinking about how to do gold mining in the bacteria world. I got the horses in the bag. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I get it. I get it. Okay. I'm done, actually. So let's talk about this. To me, while both these stories sound like there's one big genius, Lil Nas X or David Whitlock, actually underneath is a much more complex story of a confluence of digital trends, research trends, and even cultural trends that had to change or had to come together for these two to be able to disrupt well-established industries and well-established ways of doing things. Absolutely. I mean, the point is there could be many David Whitlocks out there who, you know, do self-experimentation of some sort at the fringes of society, and many of which we will never hear from. But here's someone who followed this idea, and then what he was doing converged with where broader society or this emerging industry was going. And same with Lil Nas X, who actually rode a number of these trends, viral tweets, TikTok challenges, to then come to challenge a well-established industry and a well-established way of thinking about that, such as the Billboard Hot Country Songs chart. And in this case here, the interesting thing is that there might actually be quite a profound disruption underway. A lot of the big well-known companies in this industry, such as Unilever, BASF, or SC Johnson, they're all engaged with this industry now in quite a sort of covert and sly way by investing in startups, buying startups, or experimenting, not in an open way because their brands very much still depend on the dominant narrative of bacteria killing. Much like our conversation about the chicken of tomorrow and established meat companies buying into the clean meat, lab meat industry. Exactly. Hedging their bets, not wanting to be caught out by an emerging disruption. But it also shows that quite often new ideas by their very nature have to come from the very fringes of the industry or of a particular field, Lil Nas X had no ties to the country music industry, and neither did David Whitlock have anything to do with pharmaceuticals or the beauty health industry. He was basically coming from the construction industry. To me, it's also about how we think about disruption and innovation. We're very used to analyzing industries and dynamics in those industries in certain ways. So surprisingly, things like TikTok and the Yeehaw Challenge and the role that maybe Chinese tech companies would play 
in the Lil Nas X story really flew under the radar, yet it was integral to the way that story developed. So the usual ways in which we think about problems or the categories that we use to analyze disruption in these industries might themselves be challenged. And finally, and that's actually what we've done on the podcast, when we look back on these stories, we often pick out the lone inventor. We tell it as a human interest story. We assign a lot of agency to Lil Nas X or David Whitlock, and we make these hero stories when, in fact, so many different things have to converge, coincidences have to happen, serendipitous discoveries, a school teacher being interested in why her horses would roll around, a bored rapper who is good on social media on a whim starting off creating this song. A lot of these things are obviously not intentional, but they tend to converge to a perfect storm that then brings about disruption. And we intend to look at these sorts of stories for the next hundred episodes of the future this week. But we couldn't leave this anniversary episode without returning to one of our classics. It's, it's a, a Musk. Musk. Elon Musk has been in the media again. A fair bit. Among other things, and uh, this comes from CNET, Elon Musk says Tesla will make a leaf blower for some reason. What do you do when you're an inventor who has at his disposal a whole engineering team? You take to Twitter on a fine April morning and you say that Tesla is going to develop a quiet electric leaf blower. And then you throw tons of cash and young engineers at the problem and try to fix whatever annoyed you that morning. You know, if it's traffic, then you'll build a tunnel and you just start digging. No idea why you'd build a flamethrower, but... Well, you know, and before we all fly to Mars, let's say thank you, everyone, for sticking with us for 100 episodes. If you want your friends, your family, your colleagues to learn about the podcast, please. Like us, share, reshare, leave us a comment on any of the major podcasting platforms. Or come see us live at Vivid this year, Vivid Sydney, Vivid Sydney Ideas, on Friday night, June 7th, for Love Machine. How digital humans change our lives. We'll be on stage with our colleague Mike Seymour. Michaela Letwich. And Hao Li is joining us from USC to discuss the latest and greatest in digital human technology and how it will impact our lives. And so this is all we have time for today. See you soon. On the future. Next week. This week? Yes, but next week. On the future this week. Next week. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. This was the future this week. Made possible by the Sydney Business Insights team and members of the Digital Disruption Research Group. And every week right here with us, our sound editor, Megan Wedge, who makes us sound good. And keeps us honest. Our theme music was composed and played live on a set of garden houses by Lindsay Pollack. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us online on Flipboard, Twitter, or sbi.sydney.edu.au. If you have any news that you want us to discuss, please send them to sbi at sydney.edu.au. So, Sandra, what happened in the future this week? I had it. I swear I did. <laughs> I had an angle. That's your Easter egg.